Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Val. Can we uh, can we turn off the lights? Thank Certainly. You. Um, the outside ones, any are you you're good for? We'll yes. Good evening, good evening. Good evening. I've been in the Albion Hotel with my three sisters all day, so um, <laughs> things are good. And that's a wonderful part about Canada that they so Yeah, and I think the last time I was in the Albion Hotel with these two guys in the back uh, <laughs> in uh, 1973, just before leaving home. So um, it's a wonderful town, Guelph, and uh, delighted, uh, delighted to be here. <laughs> Uh, Val, that was a wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, ex uh, sort of apologize for my title, uh, Canada 150MG. Um, Val is very, and Claire, very proactive. And uh, it was over about a year ago, maybe more than a year ago, when they invited me to come and be part of this Becoming Canada series. And uh, I said, sure. And the, the trick there is to write a title that is not too interruptive of what you might want to say in a year. <laughs> uh, but at the time, I was working on a uh, presentation to open sesquicentennial year, um, which was uh, actually a collection of almost national anthems. And I actually had a four-piece band, and uh, it was really fun, but it was all about singing um, these alternative national anthems. And at some time, at like somehow around there, Canada 15 OMG came along and oh well anyway but I'm in Guelph and delighted to be here uh, this is my my boyhood stomping ground and uh, uh, it's uh, it's wonderful to be back and to be able to spend the day with my my three sisters and um, yeah uh, Riverside Park and uh, you know museums and archives are wonderful things but sometimes they provide surprises and I got a serious surprise Val the other day, I was remembering the old bridge, and I think somebody burnt it down, um, the old bridge over the speed at Riverside Park. And uh, I went looking for a black and white image of the old bridge, and I found it, which is really cool. But what's, what's even cooler, it's taken on May 31st, 1966. I'm pretty sure that's Jimmy Raffin right there. <laughs> I can smell that place. I remember the fire guys from the end of the road. I think that might be Dave Suderman. I'm not sure. But what we're doing is we're catching suckers that have come up the river in the spring to spawn, and they've been stopped by the, the dam. And I used to gather those by the bucketful, and my dad would take them and plant one sucker under each rose bush. Uh, he didn't know anything about the three sisters, which is typically what you would do if you're Mississauga of the New Credit or if you're Mohawk down here, you would plant beans, squash and corn together and you'd put a fish in the mound to nourish those three, those three plants. But um, so I've uh, just, just in coming here, I've been having a trip down, down memory lane. I have no idea if that is me, but um, uh, it sure feels right and about the right age and the right haircut and the right bed boots and and uh, but I can smell smell the river and that that was a growing up and when I come here it's a kind of an old factory treat and uh, um, but you know the other day uh, I was um, I was bought at Woolworths uh, at the uh, up at the, the Dominion Plaza up at uh, Stevenson and Speedvale 19 cents what a deal eh? but um, uh, it's about two weeks ago, I was invited by the, boy, uh, the scouts of Canada, they're not Boy Scouts anymore, to speak to the graduating class of all the scouts who've achieved their uh, Chief Scouts Award. It used to be called the Queen Scout Award and their Queen's Venturer. And uh, it was a really big deal. There were about 200 scouts um, in a big hall in uh, Whitby. And uh, they asked if I would come and speak to them about being a scout. And I did that. But lo and behold, I was digging through my stuff and I found the first journal that I ever filled out, which was on my first class journey as a scout. And I think it was in 1966 or 7. And I, I want to take you there. So the first class journey in scouts was about Scouter Petrie, uh, the, one of the boss scouters, not Scouter Mickus, who was our scouter at Knox Church. And uh, he had a series of coordinates. We'd been taught how to read topographic maps, and we were given coordinates and questions, and he dropped us off on Highway 
sick somewhere on the way out by Breslau, nearly Breslau, and we were given, uh, not nearly, it just seemed really far, it was probably, like it was probably where Canadian Tire is now up there, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we were given a route that um, Victor Dyke and I for, for this, and uh, we were to answer these questions along here, and at that time uh, I was, um, and still am, a kind of uninspired student of language, um, uh, and, and school was something that was just sort of a, you needed to be as concerned about as possible. Um, having said that, uh, one of my teachers, Mrs. Harrison, is here. I still remember a little bit of Latin, Mrs. Harrison, but <laughs> not a great deal. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, we were on our way around town, and the reason I'm telling you this is because this is really where the foundation of uh, what is... Uh, has been my life pattern got established uh, right here but I want to show you some features of this journal because it's pretty impressive like look at the lettering on that that <laughs> that's pretty good I think but Scouter Petrie had said that we needed to have a leaf collection <coughs> along the way but Victor and I we had some issues so we didn't actually collect leaves along the way so I did them in the yard when I got home and being uh, prepared as a scout um, you know, uh, I, we, I had a tulip leaf, uh, a noted native species from the bush, you know, the wilderness <laughs> north of town. Um, anyway, here's my leaf collection, but I want you to show, show you that how, how, how I tied them in. There was no tape in the Raffin household that day, so I used bandages. <laughs> and it's still there. Yeah, 19 cent scribbler. But, uh, so sketches and stories um, was part of the deal, and uh, so at one point uh, we'd come going across uh, the road to Fergus and Alora on, at Ponsonby, and we crossed there, and uh, we bought half a loaf of bread at the store at Annettville, I think, is that, is that right? Yeah. Yeah? Um, anyway, we were deep in the wilderness back there, and we circled back to the Speed River at one point, and the question was, uh, there's a mill at this grid reference, go and see uh, who, who made it and who lives there now. So we answered the questions. It says, um, go to the mill across the, the river. It was a grist mill built in 1857 by a man called Mr. Armstrong. An artist lives here now called Ken Danby. Oh so we, we knocked on the door and we went into I think it's, it's like, I don't know if it's the mill and Danby and his family lived in the house, but anyway, he was alone in his studio and we're there, these two kids. And of course, this is the same Ken Danby who eventually produced, you know, some pretty iconic, uh, that didn't come along until 74, but I think this is what was on the easel that day in the thing. But, so I'm like 12 or 13 and I beheld genius, right? <laughs> and uh, I'm answering the questions and so I've dutifully reported all that and an artist lives here now called Ken Danby and you'd think being a you know a skilled observer although I was only 12 or 13 of the human condition I had just encountered genius and there would be some trenchant comment here about the art or the guy or here's the next line he also has a big dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, that's where my writing career got started too. And uh, I think book 19 is in the works right now, but you never know what's going to happen. But that started a, something of a uh, fascination with the work of Ken Danby, who was uh, from the Sioux, but a paddler in his own right and a, a canoeist in his own right. And uh, I think there are two kinds of artists now, those who know what canoes look like and can, can draw them and those who can't. Danby was one of them. And so as a result, uh, I, I was interested in Ken Danby's work uh, from that moment on in a strange kind of way. And uh, when Paul Steep and I went off to Queen's University, in 1973, Paul too was uh, a fan of, uh, of Ken Danby, and in 1974, in the fall at Gallery Moose in Yorkville, we used to travel by the train from here to Toronto, and quite often there was a, a layover in Toronto, and we went up to Yorkville. Of course, Yorkville was still pretty hip at that point, and Gallery Moose was there. And I want to say that uh, at that day at the Gallery Moose, I met a woman who was with me through my entire university career. 
Uh, she never said much in, in our long relationship together, uh, but she did uh, inform our living circumstances um, almost every day. And uh, that's the woman who was on the wall. And the only reason I put this in here, her name then was Lynn Gray, and she lived across the road from uh, Ken Danby on a mink farm, as I recall. And what's very cool about a Guelph audience and coming home is Lynn sitting right there, <laughs> Miss Parkinson. <coughs> that pattern of uh, adventure uh, really started here on the Mighty Speed. And uh, it's a trip that, that uh, you know, having stared at the river for, uh, I don't know, maybe 11 or 12 years at Scouts, before we finally put the canoes into the, the river and we paddled uh, to Brantford. And that was, after that, I'd read Paddle to the Sea. I knew that I could go to the Atlantic, but I also was pretty sure I could go to the North Pole or the tip of Mount Everest in a canoe. And sadly, uh, that's me in the, in the mighty speed around about, uh, well, I guess when we moved from this end of town to the other end of the town. But um, trips here led to trips elsewhere. And unfortunately, something of a pathological fascination with those. <laughs> Um, which in turn has turned into uh, a lifetime of, of um, adventure and learning. And um, uh, there's lots, you know, in, in, our, in our lives, the turning points that happen, but there were turning points that happened. And I think probably the main turning point that happened for me was that uh, I finally realized that what I was doing in scouts, keeping journals, I didn't think that had anything to do with school. Uh, or, and it turns out it's got everything to do with education and nothing to do with school. Uh, I was a completely uninspired student, and uh, I think, you know, it's just, I don't know why school didn't catch on. Music and then extracurricular sports kind of grabbed on, but um, I think if you, you know, if you had a little citation under my high school graduation diploma, I think it would probably say music and extracurricular sports, possibly drinking at the Albion, I'm not sure. <coughs> um, but that's led to uh, some uh, incredible opportunities. Um, and this was a, uh, an opportunity to meet the neighbors that happened a couple of years ago. I thought it would be a fun idea to travel around the world at the Arctic Circle to put a human face on climate change. And uh, that's exactly what happened and turned into a wonderful uh, Christmas present of a book um, that I just happened to have a couple right over there. Um, <laughs> But um, I have actually a couple of other books. That's a brand new one I did with Andre. Uh, that's a, a love letter to the Arctic that uh, has just, uh, just come out. But um, what I wanted to say is that along the way, uh, I thought I was a scientist to begin. I started with Keith Ronald studying polar bear vision up the, the hill here. And uh, in the middle of that, um, uh, sort of veered <laughs> into the gutter, if you like, and uh, Really, uh, I was very interested in the North, not so much interested in science, but very interested in the people who took me to the bears and to other places. And so this journey around the world at the Arctic Circle was an opportunity to talk to people who live in the North about the North. And originally I'd gone with the premise that people who are at the place in the world where climate change is really happening with most dramatically, uh, would have something to say about that. And it turns out all Northerners do have something to say about climate change. But when you say, well, what's, you know, what's really governing your life decisions? Uh, they'd say, well, it's, it's cultural change. And um, as we are now coming to the end of this amazing sesquicentennial year, um, that is the frame that has shaped almost everything that's happened to me this year. And I want to just tell you a bit of a story about that today. Um, it really is a dumb title, but to be part of uh, this 11-part discussion that's gone on, I really have to commend the university and the museum and Val and Claire and others for doing this because um, it was very apparent to, uh, I'm affiliated with the Canadian Canoe Museum, but very apparent to all of us at the Canoe Museum as this anniversary was rolling up that this was not going to be uh, all about candles and cakes and, and uh, well, it was certainly not going to be about building arenas and schools as much as 1967 was, but with the things that have happened in the 50 years since the centennial, uh, we're much more aware with the land uh, acknowledgement at the beginning of a presentation in public, which are happening across the country, which is a good thing, and the relationships building underneath that's important. 
But um, this is a very different anniversary, and that became clear uh, uh, probably viscerally after Canada 15 OMG got cast as a title. But this, this talk, which happened, I think, on the 9th of January or something, I do a series to raise money for our little community in eastern Ontario, and that's, um, that's where this got unleashed to the public. But uh, we sort of went back in time, and I just thought, I picked up a couple of the <laughs> images. Remember this? Bobby Jimby? <laughs> Come on, sing along. <laughs> I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> you know that one little, two, little, three Canadians? You know what that really is, right? One little, two, little, three little Indians in the, in the original sort of nursery rhymey kind of thing that went with that. But the premise of this, uh, this talk early in the year was to say that uh, we have a national anthem written by Calixel Avalé and it was a Franco uh, person in this geography called Canada. I think it was written in 1887 or something like that. Um, and it turns out that it became our national anthem. But there are quite a number of other ditties that Maple Leaf Forever that uh, was, I'm not sure if it was Maureen Forrester, but a beautiful rendering, a very hymn-like quality that actually almost has stars and star-spangled banner kind of uh, motifs written into it. But um, how many people here went to Expo 67 in Montreal? Quite a few of you. Um, uh, the theme song of the Canadian Pavilion at Expo, do you remember what that was? Was not Canada. It was written by a guy called Oscar Brand who had a TV show and it was called Something to Sing About. And uh, he had a t it was actually written in 1962, Something to Sing About. But on his TV show he had people like Joni Mitchell and then uh, sort of an up and coming duo from somewhere else that uh, sang on it. But you may remember this, uh, I have walked across the sands of the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, raised on the ridge of the Miramichi, seen the waves tear and roar up the stone coast of Labrador, watched them roll back to the great northern sea. This is the chorus I'm probably has written into your DNA stuff. From the Vancouver Island to the Albert Highland, across the prairies, the lakes, to Ontario's towers. Okay, enough of that. <coughs> <laughs> and then we've actually voted for alternate national anthems, and of course, Northwest Passage, uh, Stan Rogers off oh, for just one time, I would take the Northwest Passage to find the hand of Franklin reaching for the Beaufort Sea, tracing one warm line through a line uh, through a land so wide and savage, and make a Northwest Passage to the sea. Um, it's a fantastic song. It's written by a guy from down the road whose wife Ariel, I ended up hanging drywall with uh, on a. <laughs> on a uh, Habitat for Humanity build a little while ago. And um, yeah, we were there. Ed Schreier was there smoking in the back of the project. Um, <laughs> but Ariel said, uh, you're from Guelph. And she said, you know, uh, I studied in Guelph. And I said, not, not how to hang drywall. And she said, no, no, I'm a nurse. And, uh, and she said, what's your last name? And I told her and she said, is your dad, dad Hamish, Raff? And, and I said, yeah. And she said, well, he was my teacher at St. Joseph's Hospital uh, <laughs> nursing place. But anyway, Northwest Passage, uh, fabulous song, probably too long to be a bit dirgish to be a national anthem. One little story I would tell you about that. Putting pictures and sound together is something I've been doing for a long time because I think Sound engages people, particularly beautiful sound and melodic sound, and engages people's imaginations the way that pictures just don't or that sound just doesn't. And a long time ago, um, our older daughter Molly, who's 31 now, uh, was sitting underneath a light table where I was cueing together a slide presentation to Northwest Passage. And you know how kids just, they sit there and they kind of soak up what everything's going on. Well, sometime after this was going on, because you have to go through it again and again and again and again, I saw little Molly sitting off in her own little world and she was singing, Ah, oh, for just one time, I would take the Northwest sausage. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's kind of cute. <laughs> I think my favorite story of alternative national anthems is one that's a result of um, uh, friendships that were built uh, when I went to seek my fortune in the West after I got my first degree at Queen's. I went out West and, and actually became something of a really bad cowboy. It filled the dream, but I've still known quite a few number of people west of High River and other places, and I still go there when, I, when I'm in Calgary to speak or something. That's Surveyor's Ridge, which is one of the most beautiful places, but in the valley beyond here is a ranch um, that's owned by Ian Tyson, and uh, he's got a huge uh, ranch there, and uh, he needs help in the spring to brand his horses and his cattle <coughs> that, um, that are coming down. So I heard this story uh, firsthand from Ian around a campfire, and he's very acerbic. He's a bit like David Suzuki. He really can't say hello without having a four-letter word in there. I mean, he's this sort of iconic uh, singer, cowboy, poet kind of guy, but when you're with him, he's got a wonderful uh, color to his, uh, his language. <laughs> but he wrote Four Strong Winds, of course, which is... Uh, with, uh, when he was with Ian and Sylvia, and it's an amazing song. Four strong winds that grow lonely, seven seas that run high, all these things that won't change, come what may, but our good times are all gone, etc., etc. Well, you may remember um, Canada, on uh, Radio 1, they had a national playlist uh, contest, and they were asking people to send in songs, of, of, you know, the, the quintessential Canadian songs, and then they were counting down from 50. And in the last week, they had the last 10 or something like that. Well, Ian had a new colt, and it was in a high pasture. And he'd gone up there. It sounds more like an ad for Silverado or GMC trucks. He was up in a really fancy GMC truck. And the truck was parked, and the doors were wide open, and CBC1 was blasting out of the truck. And he's with a lunge line, and he's schooling this colt up in the mountains. You know, the, the Rockies are up behind and the foothills fall away to his ranch below and it's just a man and his horse and it's really beautiful listening to CBC. And you know, we've all hung wallpaper or you know, done whatever to that sort of thing, but it's, that's the image of this happening. But it's also an image of a songwriter getting madder and madder and madder. He knew that Four Strong Winds had been nominated and it was in the top 50, and he knew that it was going to be in the top, but it never was coming up. They got to number four, and it was Northwest Passage. Okay, fine. Three, two, and by now, so two was if I had a million dollars by the, by the uh, bare naked ladies. Um, who I learned yesterday was, their album was produced by the same amazing producer who produced Prince. I didn't know that, but... Um, that's a total, <laughs> total aside. I got to stop doing that. Uh, um, so Ian's there with the horse. Number two is if I had a million dollars, a million freaking dollars. And he's thinking they've missed an opportunity to recognize a fabulous song. And of course, Four Strong Winds is number one. And Ian and the horse celebrate up there, just the two of them. That's a good tale. Yeah, so uh, that talk had all sorts of other stuff about uh, Canada. Yeah, could somebody get that? Yeah, where is that? Isn't that annoying? That's a Canadian invention, of course, and uh, insulin and basketball and uh, zippers. Did you know that we have a patent on zippers? And apparently we designed the brassiere, um, but a, an American stole it and re repatented it down the way. But a lot's happened since January. Um, in my thinking about the country, and I've added an extra two H's to O oh, Canada because I have a really profound sense that if we don't do something now as Canadians, uh, we're going to miss an incredible opportunity. And that shift of perspective has happened uh, as a result of what has been uh, a tumultuous, amazing year. My goal was to get to where we are now, and I'm pleased to say <laughs> I have met the goal. I wanted to end the year still married. <laughs> and although my wife Gail is not here, uh, we are very much married, and uh, 
I'm really delighted about that. And I do want to say that I could not do anything that I do without um, a place to come back to. And uh, in fact, I'm working on a, a, a stage show uh, about some of the findings of this, uh, and it's called The Way Back Home Again, and which is a line right out of Northwest Passage. Uh, but really what drives most of what goes on in my head and my heart when I'm at the edges of the earth is informed by that stretched line that takes me home again. And, uh, but this year that line was stretched uh, in ways that I had never imagined. I said yes to four different sesquicentennial initiatives. Um, the first one, uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, each of them and then a little bit more about, it had to have a canoe in it somewhere. And having heard the findings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the 94 recommendations, um, I've really been pushing the Canadian Canoe Museum to consider that yes, the canoe got us to where we are in space and time. French, English, Indigenous, it's a vessel of all three. East, West, North, it's expressed in all different ways. The Umiak and the Kayak in the North, the big dugouts in the West, the mustache shaped Biatuk canoe and the beautiful canoes of the, the, uh, the Mi'kmaq in between and the Algonquin and the bull boats, but um, that's pretty much the canoe story as it has existed, as it's expressed in other places like the Canadian Canoe Museum. But the more I thought about the canoe, the more I thought, you know, here's an opportunity to show some leadership in a country that I think needs leadership in trying to figure a way forward. And there are some very literal but important messages, being in the same boat or being on the same waterway in different boats, pulling together, some, just some very simple messages. And I thought, why don't we try to show that the canoe can be a vessel of reconciliation? And so uh, we did a trip from um, Ottawa, Kingston to Ottawa that eventually involved 171 people in five big canoes. The second thing I said yes to was being part of the planning committee for Canada C3. How many of you have actually heard of Canada C3? Some of you. It was a sesquicentennial initiative mounted by the Students on Ice Foundation to essentially keep Canada to port, to keep Canada to the left. And the idea was you put Canadians, it's pretty much the same ideas as the canoe journey I was talking about. You put a bunch of different Canadians, First Nation, uh, Inuit, Métis, and other Canadians in a vessel and you just get them to do something together. They eventually have a conversation about Canada and the future of Canada. Uh, Canada C3 was really just the same idea, only sailing from Toronto to Victoria. 150 days. Um, started on the 1st of June and we just ended <coughs> on the 30th of October. And uh, stopping in 75 communities around the way. Uh, 475 odd people were actually on the boat. We had 15 legs. Each one had different Canadians on it. And would have been on it uh, more, except that I'd said yes to two other uh, little projects. One of them was to um, lead an Arctic summit that traveled from Murmansk to the North Pole on Pidiset Let Pobirdi, which is the 50 years of victory, a big Russian nuclear powered icebreaker. Um, that was just a little side trip from Canada C3. <coughs> um, and then that wasn't enough. I came back from that and got back on C3, did another leg, and then the final thing I did was go with Students on Ice, which is an Ottawa-based organization that gets northern youth and southern youth together. This year we had 109 youth I think 53 of them were Inuit or Dene. It was really kind of cool. On Adventure Canada's ship, the Ocean Endeavour. Um, and uh, we traveled from um, uh, Resolute to Kangarlusuak, Greenland. Um, so that, uh, that's a pretty full agenda for, uh, from May to October. And um, actually, I got home from Victoria on... Uh, the 2nd of November, and I thought I was fine. Um, I said, things, email was kind of out of control, and I'd sort of forgotten that I'd agreed to do 10 talks between October 30th and now. This is the 10th one. I'm really happy about that. Each one of them was, has been enjoyable. 
Um, but some strange things have happened, and I can assure you that I'm not fine. Um, <laughs> I, I went to uh, a meeting with my publisher, Phyllis Bruce, two weeks ago in Toronto, and she's, uh, uh, her, we had lunch on, uh, on Cumberland Avenue, actually not far from Gallery Moose, um, uh, where Danby's work was, and uh, had a nice lunch. Um, I think when you're with your publisher, you should also have something expensive and liquor too, because she's buying. But I, I might have had a beer. But anyway, we finished lunch, and I needed to go to a meeting downtown for the Canoe Museum. I walked over to Young Street, and I walked for um, nearly 20 minutes the wrong way on Young Street. <laughs> this is a guy who's a fellow international of the Explorers Club. <coughs> I have... Uh, you know, a fair number of letters after my name, some of which attest to arguably navigational skills, you know, and uh, I've had some picnics in a bunch of pretty exotic places and got there under my own steam, but I was actually queuing on a building that I thought was the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, with that kind of banana top on it, which was south, well, it turns out there's one north as well. <laughs> and then, uh, so that was a bit disconcerting. Um, and then just last week, uh, I was to speak to all of the Ontario Parks people. They, every three years, they get together and they have a sort of a strategic planning conference with the minister and everybody. And uh, they were doing it up at Geneva Park, but they put their speakers in the, uh, the Rama Casino. That's a whole other... <laughs> pretty sure if there is a devil, she lives there, but, or he. Um, but I went up to the registration desk at the hotel and, I said, you know, hi, I'm, I'm here for this conference. And the woman in the desk says, oh, oh, no. Um, you're here a day early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you do when you get to the North Pole? Well, you call home, of course. Um, and I, uh, I, I didn't want to go on that trip without uh, Indigenous participation. And that's my friend uh, Hikwok. Uh, David Sirkowak, uh, who was born at Anadai Lake in behind uh, uh, Rankin Inlet. And uh, we went to the North Pole together, Hikwak and I, and it was an amazing journey. For those of you who've read uh, People of the Deer or The Desperate People, Farley Mowat, um, David is a baby in that book. And it's, it's actually quite a story. But the, uh, it was a pretty neat invitation from Quark to... They, uh, they had three trips to the North Pole, and the middle one, about 18 months ago, wasn't selling like the other two. It's kind of a premium trip, as you might imagine. Um, and they said, would you come and you can invite any six people you want from anywhere in the world to be other thought leaders on this trip? I said, well, they asked me if I'd like to do that, and then they said, and would you like to do it on a Russian icebreaker going to the North Pole? And I said, well, I'll get back to you. Um, but it was so fun. Alan Chambers has been to the North Pole more times than anybody under his own steam. This was 16 times in April this year. Maureen Ramo is the director of the Lamont Doherty uh, Earth Observation Lab at Columbia University. Paul Nicklin is... Uh, um, He's a hoser from Tisdale, Saskatchewan is what he is, but he's uh, the, probably the preeminent underwater photographer for National Geographic. And his uh, partner, Christina Mitterrand, who's a, a hot-blooded a Mexican woman who uh, made her, her place in the world with ethnographic photography of the Chiapas people in, uh, in Brazil um, in their response to the river being dammed. David, of course, is an Inuit elder. Franz Van Ulmer, um, this was like the ultimate opportunity to get really interesting people together. I'd met Fran, and she was the deputy uh, governor of Alaska, but she, was always, she is the chair of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission and the chancellor of the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. Very interesting woman, but Quark did a couple of things that was, made this trip quite interesting. If you've been on a ship, you'll appreciate this. So the first trip ran really well with their existing resource people, and Quark forgot to tell um, the people on the ship that seven other people were coming to be the, the staff on the expedition. So we had some negotiating to do. The other thing they forgot to tell me was that uh, of the 105 or six people 60 of them were unilingual Mandarin-speaking Chinese people. 
And uh, that added some, anyway. <laughs> there are a lot of stories there, like how Seamus from Guelph joined the Russian Navy. I'm not going to tell that tonight. <laughs> but I want to just take you to nine little stops along the way to give you a flavor, um, which is about me getting a new sense of Canada um, uh, in this sesquicentennial year, because it really has been, uh, been an epic year. This um, canoe journey, the premise was very simple. We were going to try to show that the canoe can be a vessel of reconciliation. We'd put all sorts of different people in it. We would stop in communities. We wouldn't camp. We would, we would interact with the communities who were there. And we would paddle from Kingston to Ottawa. And we were getting to Ottawa on the 13th of May, which was the annual conference of the Community Foundations of Canada. And there are, I think, 191 community foundations, and they represent 90% of Canada. And it was an opportunity to give them a message about the canoe as a vessel of reconciliation. So we started with one canoe that held 16 people, and by the time we got to Ottawa, we had five canoes, uh, all big canoes. We had um, a skin-on-frame Umiak, a 25-footer. We had uh, this Montreal canoe. We had a couple of... Um, uh, North Canoes, 26-foot Voyager canoes, and we had a, a beautiful West Coast spirit dancer, Haida style spirit dancer, 38 feet. Uh, it holds about 20 people. It was, it was absolutely amazing. But we invited along a really wonderful young uh, filmmaker, and I'd engaged him for a 60-second 60 60 film about the essence of this trip. And he said he would come for two days for what I was paying him. And out of the goodness of his heart, because he thought this was a cool idea, he didn't come for two days, he came for six, and brought an assistant with a vehicle. He, had, he flew drones, and instead of a one-minute piece with sound and coloring and all the other things that he did, he gave us a six-minute film that gives you, I think, a remarkable, and, well, I want to just show it to you. This is uh, what happened on Connected by Canoe. In order to explore the whole idea of reconciliation, you really do have to put everything on the table. I think we've got a lot of work to do to not only reconcile ourselves culturally, but also reconcile ourselves with ourselves, how we live our lives and the choices we make. Nothing is going to change collectively if we don't find a way to change ourselves individually. Connected by Canoe was an idea that the canoe can be a vessel to teach Canadians about being in the same boat and the value of pulling together. Blessing us for this good day today. and uh... It was a journey from Kingston to Ottawa that was less like a canoe trip and more like a floating conversation about the future of Canada. But at a deeper level, I believe that a canoe trip is an incredible opportunity as a collective where you share the experience of being hungry, you share the experience of the weather as it comes, and out of that shared experience can be built trust. One of the backbones of canoe tripping is being in a group and it changes how you think. It's not about you, it's about all of you. The canoe can be a metaphor for how, as a society, we pull together. If we don't do that, we're not going to be able to go forward. I think that we've lost our sense of community and I think if we're going to make real change and we're going to have reconciliation I think it starts at that community level I think we have to care about the people next door when you really really think about that I think that's what evokes change and and tolerance and acceptance and growth this journey I think achieved great strides to kind of find a forum find a context for really rethinking a country 
that seriously needs rethinking. There seems to be not very many opportunities to share our misapprehensions, our guilt, our uh, aspirations for the future. Maybe truth and reconciliation starts with truth of real history, and then, you know, reconciling that is, is something that I think comes later. I think Canada has stuff that they prefer didn't happen in the past. And the challenge is how do you get over that and get on with the future and actually still have some self-respect and, um, and confidence you can do better. How do we mend the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians? How do we close inequality gaps that are in our society? And how do we do that in unity? If you do everything as an individual, it's not strong. It has to be done by pulling together and working together with, with what we have. We're hoping that uh, the messages that everyone carries will overflow and, uh, and get out there. There's some real momentum right now in the world for change. describe this journey would be unity, hope, acceptance, inspirational, responsibility, insightful, faith, ultimately joyous. I think I would say love. The love that is shared by people of common purpose. After you've kind of walked a portage trail, you've shared your coal, you've laughed together and you've cried together, there was this sense of real and tangible connection. And I think that probably is about as close to love as anything I've ever felt. It had a dimension to it uh, that has left me feeling exhausted, but full of hope. There's a cheery bit of repertoire, eh? Mm. <laughs> so, uh, the mayor was part of, the mayor of the little township where I live was part of the band for Canada 150MG. He was one of the four people. And he came to the dinner we had in Sealy's Bay as we passed through on the way up to Ottawa. And he led O Canada. But by that time, we'd been on the water for three days. And... Uh, had talked a lot about the experience of the indigenous people who are in the canoe. And uh, as the mayor started singing a cappella, O Canada, I looked at all of the indigenous people in our group and none of them was singing. And from that moment on, I pretty much have choked on the national anthem. And it's really kind of weirdly ironic that this presentation that I gave in January was alternative national anthems. I've spent the rest of the year looking for alternative national anthems that somehow capture a different Canada uh, along the way. So same game here. Instead of putting people in a canoe and getting them to have a conversation about Canada, you put them on an icebreaker, you start in Toronto and you, you move around. So. I want to take stops along the way, and uh, as I said, and uh, just to give you a flavor, I'm, I'm blathering on too much, but these are some of the really hard-hitting moments of, of this trip. 
So do you remember Oka, uh, the summer of 1990, the so-called Indian summer when Corporal LeMay of the Sûreté de Quebec was killed and there was the blockade around a golf course and that, do you remember that? Well, that was a huge moment in my life, probably maybe in your life too. I just, I, I could not believe it. And I was doing the comprehensive exams for my PhD in cultural geography at the time and it was a pivotal moment in that, in that process, but I'd never been to Ganawage which is not where Oka happened, but do you remember when elders were leaving a community going through a thing called Whiskey Trench? They were in cars and people were bringing bottles and rocks and bricks at the cars as the elders were leaving town. Well, that's the track across the Mercy Bridge to Ganawage, but Ganawage, we went there with the most wonderfully attitudinous Mohawk babe who was part of our group on the ship called Teo Horn. That's Teo with her mother who was an amazing activist from Ganawage. Um, She's a story in her own right, but I learned from Dio that Ganawage means the place by the river, the place by the rapids. And I also learned because she took us to swim in a quarry right at town. This was an unplanned swim, basically. She said, if you want to understand Ganawage, you've got to come to the quarry and swim. So we did. The rock from here was used to build the St. Lawrence Seaway including a great big coffer dam that runs right along the entire community called the place by the river. So it's now the place by the St. Lawrence Seaway. There's not one piece of natural water along this community. No wonder they're mad. But the most amazing thing happened there. We went to a school a Mohawk language school, which like a lot of incredible cultural initiatives is paid for by bake sales and raffles. And we were greeted by the first Mohawk people in three generations for whom Mohawk is a first language. They've gone to that school and the kids went around and they did the words that come before all else, which is a Mohawk prayer that thanks everything under the sun. It can go on for three days. But they did that all in Mohawk and all from their hearts. It was an amazing thing. But Tio was, she's a horror movie actress. <laughs> Who knew? And I hate horror movies because they're really scary and I don't like to be scared. Um, but um, the beauty of being in a canoe or on a ship is that you eat together and you do stuff together. And that's what we did as we started sailing down the river from... Uh, from uh, Montreal and one of the jobs that I have as a staffer who also has seamen's papers is I, that I love this, I'd leave the ship in the middle of the night in the middle of the St. Lawrence River and would go in on a zodiac and up to the ramparts of Quebec at three in the morning to find a ladder to climb up so I could tie up the ship when it came in. Well this is in Trois-Rivières just a ways downstream from Montreal and I remember climbing up on the, uh, on the bank here at about three in the morning. There's a lone busker, not a soul in sight. There's a lone busker playing his guitar at three in the morning. I didn't have a scent on me. I, had, I was nicely dressed to be driving a Zodiac, but uh, uh, we were in town for, to do what we did along the way. And um, it was uh, just the next stop along the way. Well, Theo and I ended up riding bikes on the, uh, around around Trois-Rivières and uh, as it happened there were three pianos downtown um, Trois-Rivières last summer and turns out Dio is not a bad piano player and so we took turns playing the piano and talking and we got talking about Oka. She was really little and uh, she said, uh, you know, she told me that although she was only four or something like that at the time, she still remembers the smell of tear gas and she still remembers the fear in her mom and her sister and how much of that has come later, I don't know. But I told her the story of wanting to do a, an investigation in how, for my PhD about how people are connected to land and to landscape and it was that summer, that debacle on television that convinced me I needed to do that in a cross-cultural context. And I told Dio that at, at this time as we sat and tinkled on the piano and talked. And uh, we got talking about some of the ways that that moment, those moments in time have been etched on both of us there. And um, so I, I said, you know, you'll, you'll remember that image. And she said, yeah, I was, I was right there. 
And she said, do you remember another image from that same time behind the blockades when a woman, a teenage woman, was accidentally stabbed by a Canadian soldier's bayonet in the chest? And uh, I said, yeah, I, I think so. And I, I said, I seem to remember she had a little sister and a blue raincoat hanging around her neck or something. And she said, yeah, that was me. And that's her sister, Juanique, who's now a doctor. But what do you say to somebody who's been living in an image in your brain for all those years? And I was absolutely overcome. And for, strangely, <laughs> at a total loss for words. I didn't know what to say to her. So we just walked and rode our bikes and had another week or so together. But when the word reconciliation comes out, uh, I'm really beginning to appreciate that we really have no idea about the Mississauga of the New Credit or of the Neutral or of the Mohawks, you know, who were here and the kind of privileges we took along the way. So, Onward. I was in Charlottetown for Canada Day, but by then I'd found Kent Monkman. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen that beautiful painting? Yeah, it's a, it's a doozy. He's making a point here. Um, well, one of the things we did with a, by now a new group of people is we all sat around a likeness of that table where the Fathers of Confederation sat. And I want to just tell you a story. The leader of our session here was a professor from the University of uh, Prince Edward Island who was going to give us this kind of history lesson, but he posited to our group, this was the first day of the fourth, fourth leg, um, if you were sitting around this table today and inventing Canada, what would Canada look like? Almost a rhetorical kind of question, just let it just, well, this woman sitting here, who's part of the group, is Marie Wilson, who's one of the commissioners of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And she points at the professor guy, and she said, well, if this were my Canada, you, sir, who is running the event, shouldn't be sitting in a place of power at this table where Brian Francis, the chief of the PEI Mi'kmaq, is kind of camped on the corner. She said, in my Canada, I would put, show a chief some respect and put him at the end of the table. And lo and behold, there was a lot of shuffling. And here you can see Chief Francis is here, and our professor is sort of on the corner. It was a lovely moment in time, and that guy had no idea what was coming. He got to the Charlottetown Accord. He was talk, going through history, and he said, that was an absolute disaster constitutionally. And a guy just to his right, who's sitting just behind here, put up his hand and said, well, I was there and I didn't think it was a disaster. It's Stephen Cackfee, who was the premier of the Northwest Territories at the time. He said it was the first time Indigenous people had been taken seriously in a constitutional deliberation. Anyway, it was, it was an amazing moment that wouldn't have happened. We did some other crazy stuff in uh, Charlottetown, I met pirates. We were able to meet the guy whose family business um, from um, just down here from Bainesville or somewhere. Uh, they're doing uh, all the fireworks for all the, uh, yeah, anyway. Another little moment, we go north now to um, into July, uh, maybe early August. Catherine McKenna by this time is on the ship and um, she makes the announcement about uh, Imanga, which is the Lancaster Sound Marine Protected Area. And was it ever neat for her to be able to talk about how um, Canada is committing to some very lofty targets. The Pathway to Canada Target 1 is shooting for 17% of our land to set aside, but in some really interesting collaborative ways. And McKenna is there as the minister 
of uh, climate change and environment to talk about the creation of this new protected area. But what was really, really interesting, P.J. Akaguk, uh, who is the head of the Kikiktani Inuit Association, Minister of the Crown stands up and says, isn't it wonderful we've set aside all this, the boundaries of this area. They haven't negotiated what's actually going to happen in the communities. P.J. stands up there and says, this is great. This is going to bring us an airport, it's going to bring us uh, coastal improvements. And then Mary Simon, as a backup to this, who's one of our great Inuit leaders in this country, she actually said, conservation is about building infrastructure for indigenous people, which is a very different take, but there are new kinds of collaborations happening. Shell had a bunch of exploratory leases in that area and they actually took them away. Interestingly, Shell was not at the announcement, but they were able to take, give up those leases and that's why that massive area was be able to set aside. The World Wildlife Fund was there, David Miller was there in his amazing panda suit that he had and uh, said nothing and I don't know why, but they've got an incredible interactive uh, website. Conservation is not just about conservation anymore. It's about building long-term sustainable futures for everybody concerned and that's a case. A couple of examples I want to do quickly of things that hit me with climate change. That's the very short north slope of the Yukon. It's only about 250 kilometers looking back from Herschel Island which is a whaling station. Richard Gordon who's a long time, he's a, a Nuvialuit, long time uh, a guide there. When he was young that, as far as he could see, that land would slope down tundra down to the water. And because of the melting of permafrost, it's fracturing. And he said when those slumps happen, you can feel it on your chest. It sets up a, a sonic wave. And uh, just looking at it, it, it was just so dramatic. Sailing on another really, really... Uh, um, memorable evidence of, of climate change and evidence of the goodness of human nature. Carolyn Cannon greeted me with a hug I have never <laughs> felt in my life. And she just came and just almost squeezed the breath out of me with this amazing smile. And I sort of pushed her away a little bit and I said, do I know you? And she said, no. <laughs> and so, you know, this is after like a, a, a really cold 55 minute Zodiac ride. And uh, so I'm standing there and, and she said, you know, I won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and I said, no shit. <laughs> and it turns out she didn't win the Nobel Prize. She won the, the Goldman Prize. But, um, but she was leading the charge of the seismic testing in the uh, Chukchi Sea. And an amazing woman. But... We were there, this is a, a whaling community on the Alaskan coast and still whaling, still very much part of it. And they have these incredible uh, frozen rooms in the permafrost. But we went to a session that they did jointly and the first thing they said was that this project we're working on, which nobody seemed to want to call a park, although it is technically a national park reserve, what we are doing together as Haida and federal parks people is, is an agreement based on a disagreement. Nobody agrees who owns this land. The Haida say it's theirs and the feds say it's theirs. But instead of bickering about that, they've just moved on. And they're now jointly managing it. And that was a huge breakthrough for me. You know, we spend so much time on land disposition and tenure and those sorts of issues, they've just stepped over it and they said, we'll figure it out one day. But in the meantime, let's do what we're going to do. And man, the best story that Gu Zhao told that was not with his drum, which was amazing. He was with us for a bunch of days. You know, this is the Queen Charlotte Islands, right? You know what they did? And the, the big ceremony, they had a whole movie about this, like about a 35 minute movie. All, about, all they did is they got a Bentwood box and they wrote Queen on one piece of paper and put it in. Charlotte on the other in it and they had a huge ceremony and all they did was give the premier back those two words. 
And from now on, it's Guayanas. Or Hai to Guay, Gu at the bottom, Hai to Guay, the whole. Wonderful. And we learned a lot of stuff, but Bev Sellers is an indigenous chief from the West Coast, Nuchalnath chief, I think, and uh, she's talking about how, she talks about the unwritten 95th recommendation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We cannot reconcile with each other until we recon reconcile with Mother Nature first. And that came to me as something of a revelation too, about how looking after nature is really looking after us. And we've got some incredible examples to teach us that. The scrapbook from this year has been, is full. I have really just scratched the surface of some of the incredible people I've met. Marie Wilson, who's as stern as stern can be on some topics, but is probably one of the most crazy people. Um, Grace King, who's an amazing actress. This is her getting stopped in Clem to on the road by people who figured out that this is her under the, uh, the, the uh, hood and everything for an autograph. Patrick uh, Watson was my uh, roommate and he's, he's fetting, uh, uh, invited us down to Montreal a couple of weeks ago to fet uh, Leonard Cohen. Vicky, well, anyway, it goes on and on and on. This woman is actually one of the videographers. We had a fancy dress party uh, in sort of in extremis off Alaska. We'd been shipbound a bit too long. We decided we'd dress up. She came as Julie Payette. <laughs> and she came in in slow-mo in as if she were an astronaut. And I'm here to tell you, having spent a chunk of yesterday with Julie Payette, the Governor General, um, on a very dignified occasion, that she actually nailed the GG with, uh, with this thing. Oh, come on, Jim. Tell us why you were with Julie Payette. Julie Payette gave me Canada's Meritorious Service Medal for... <laughs> the best part was I was there with my wife and two daughters and two great supporters, and it's for, uh, for um, uh, work bringing the Canadian Canoe Museum out of bankruptcy into a place where it's ready to come onto the national stage. Um, and, thank you. But I want to bring it back here because I know if you're here and if you've been part of this, this series, you care about who we are and where we're going. And what I, the message I want to bring back to you that comes out of this summer is that reconciliation, I think, is no more complicated than meeting the neighbors and doing something with them. And they're around. There are friendship centers and um, it, um, it's no more complicated than that. And amazing things happen and you have seriously awkward moments, guaranteed, that will make you squirm. But um, museums, universities, we're all working at it together. But just getting together to do things together, uh, the, the idea of connected by canoe, we're hoping to grow that out. Of course, Mr. Canoehead, I'm not a very reliable witness when it comes to canoes because everybody else said, well, yeah, you know, that's, he's, that's him. He's got a couch that's a canoe for God's sake. <laughs> but there are other things you can do too. It doesn't really matter whether it's getting together to sing or to do those sorts of things. But I want to tell you that, uh, just to finish, um, that my search for a new national anthem is, is ongoing. We had a, an amazing young woman uh, traveling with us, an Ojibwa woman on Connected by Canoe, who sang an Ojibwa water song with her drum. Wishita day, uh, Wishita day. Do. And it was beautiful. She sang it to the four directions. And then another woman in Perth, at the table in Perth, another Ojibwa woman sang a very similar water song, which I, it was very moving. But it was celebrating water, it was celebrating people, it was celebrating the relationship. And the woman is the water keeper in that culture. And, and that really touched me as a possibility for, for National Anthem. But it's, it's rooted in Ojibwa culture. What about Inuit and that sort of thing? And I just want to leave you with a, uh, a song, actually. Um, and if there's time, we could maybe uh, have questions or comments. Um, one thing that delighted me was in the only place on Canada C3, the ship, where everybody could meet, which was a, an old aircraft, uh, like a helicopter hangar on the back. That's the only place everybody could meet. In that hangar was a birch bark canoe that was borrowed from the Canadian Canoe Museum that I hung up there. And for every group, they got a lecture about Canada's a nation of rivers. It's a river of nations. 
and how we need to pull together and da 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 da. And it was there kind of as a symbol, invited there by Jeff Green, the expedition leader. But on leg two, uh, there were amazing musicians on every leg, but on leg two, there's a, a beautiful Métis singer full of energy called Andrea Menard. And with her was Heather Rankin from the Rankin family, that incredible voice, uh, singing an Irish lament when we got to Gros Isle, where, where all the Irish are buried in the St. Lawrence. But Heather, amazing voice. And Alex Cuba, my roommate, the most amazing Latin, well, he's in the process, he's won a bunch of Grammys, he's an amazing guy. The three of those people listened to this blatherage about the nation of rivers, the river of nations. And lo and behold, sitting on a bus going to Ganawagi, they cooked up a, a chorus. River of nations, nation of rivers, flowing together on the way to the sea, sowing our stories like the beads of the wampum. Nous sommes les couleurs, couleurs de la centre fléchée. These are the colors of the, of the Métis sash. And uh, they just started, and it was spontaneous on the bus. We were all sitting there clapping and stuff. Well, lo and behold, we did a little recording of it at the end of leg two, but somehow that song survived. And it's a, it's a, I was asking my musical sister, Helen, who's here, there is a name for a song that has the same words that are rendered, same words in chorus, uh, but it's rendered in different languages. And so they started doing it, and of course, the lovely Dio Horn sang it in Mohawk. And, uh, but what happened as the C3 went along is it kind of became an anthem. River of Nations, Nation of Rivers. And I want to play it for you because I'm, I'm nominating this as a, a contender anyway. The sun and moon, wind and water Carry us, we are a canoe Sailing with no distance between us Is long overdue En temps, la mer, l'air et la terre Comme l'on vogue en regret du vent Conjuguant nos corps au présent Nous prenons le large Nous prenons le large River of nations, a nation of rivers Flowing together on the way to the sea So in our stories with the beads of a wampum Nous sommes les couleurs de la ceinture fléchée Here and now, let's rest. 
Thanks. <laughs> so this is the last of 11, Val. And uh, I hope you do it again next year. And um, I hope that, uh, uh, that uh, the new learnings from this year will be incorporated, incorporated into next year's thing. So I'll leave it there. I don't know.